Having been a top flight UK tuning company since 1984, Talk Developments International continues to provide successful engineering solutions to motorsport and professional car enthusiasts. My name's Sam Baldwin, and I have over 10,000 hours of real world experience here in the Dyno Cell. I'm going to give you a glimpse at how we work here on a day to day basis in the world of professional tuning. So, tyres. Um, I think anybody who's worked at all with the automotive industry, especially if they've worked in motorsport, will tell you that tyres are a complex subject, possibly the most complex subject to understand fully. They're also incredibly important. One of my favourite ways to start motorsport engineering lectures is to ask the room what the most important part of a racing car is. Some people would say engine, a lot of people nowadays will say aerodynamics, only a handful of the real geeky ones will say tyre, but it is absolutely the tyre. If you've driven in a vehicle that's thrown you sideways in the seat, thrown you back in the seat, maybe even had you hanging into the seat belt on the brakes, all of those forces, any force you've ever felt inside of a running vehicle has been reacted by its tyre's contact patches. And just to remind you, its tyre contact patches and its tyres aren't bolted to the vehicle. They're seated on a beat. No mechanical link to the chassis. A fascinating piece of kit. In order to understand suspension geometry and suspension setup, we first need to talk about the three main modes in which a tyre, a rubber tyre, grips against a road surface and generates those forces for us at the tyre contact patch. Primarily, the fundamental method that rubber tyres use to generate forces for us is what's known as hysteresis. This involves the rubber material keying in, that is to say, changing its shape, bending its shape, to, adhere, to, act, to take the shape of the road. Now, when you think of a road surface, you probably think of it as you see it from five, six feet away. Think of it in the way that it looks under a microscope, like a mountain range. The rubber keys into that mountain range-esque surface and hugs it to a very, very tight level. Think of it, if you like, of a formable membrane falling over a series of pyramids stacked to each other, next to each other. If you were then to force this deformable rubber across the top of those pyramids, as the rubber moved across the top of the pyramids, the pyramids would force the rubber to change shape on the incoming side as the rubber then went over the top of the pyramid and then reformed to its original shape on the other. Hysteresis is about the mismatch of force needed to deform the rubber versus the amount of force that the rubber gives back when it takes its original shape again. There is a mismatch in force. It takes more force to make the rubber change shape in the first place than the rubber then gives back when it retakes its original shape. That mismatch in energy, that mismatch in force, is what allows the tyre to generate forces for us in grip. It's also what makes tyres get warm. The movement of the rubber molecules against one another inside the set fluid creates internal friction and that's where tyre temperature comes from. We're concerned about tyre temperature, not necessarily because of the temperature, but because of the effect the temperature has on the rubber's viscosity. That is to say how thick, how slippery the rubber is as a set fluid or a melting fluid. In this mode of hysteresis, where it's keying into the road surface and then being forced to deform and reform at quick, regular intervals, the amount of effort that's required to deform the rubber, for it then to reform, for it to deform again, is absolutely linked to how liquid the rubber is. The rubber is extremely cold and very hard. It takes an awful lot of force to get the rubber to change shape in the first place. But then the rubber will also be slow to give the force back. In these conditions, the rubber can be overloaded. We can ask the rubber to change shape in too fast a way, and we can actually tear molecules from the surface of the rubber. In this instance, known in motorsport as cold graining. It's similar to grating mozzarella cheese. 
we're not actually moving rubber around in a, an efficient way. We're not moving rubber molecules inside the tire, and we're not generating heat inside the tire, but we are removing material. We see this kind of ugly grip generation that's very, very costly in terms of wear rate when we hear tires screeching on a road surface and leaving black lines. The black line is made up of rubber particles that have been literally ripped from the surface of the tire. The screeching noise is the cyclic loading, tearing and therefore unloading of the tire in local patches across its contact patch. Hysteresis, when done right, doesn't tear rubber molecules from the surface. Getting hysteresis done right is about getting hysteresis done under enough vertical pressure on the tire contact patch, but also when the tire is warm enough and supple enough to agree to change shape at the rate that you are asking it to change shape at. Hysteresis makes up approximately 70 to 80% of the net grip in most tires operation. It's topped up by chemical adhesion. We're all familiar with chemical adhesion. Anyone who's ever worn a sticky plaster or used blue tack. Small, very, very close range or short range chemical forces that can be taken, that can take place between two, two substances or two chemicals that are held together. What we're saying by this is that the rubber in the tire can be made of such a material so that when it becomes in contact with the road, it sticks quite literally. It generates a small chemical force with the road that then has to be ripped away. That chemical adhesion can be a really powerful adder to hysteresis grip. The problem with it is that it's a very short range force and if you separate the surface of your rubber tire from the road by perhaps powder or water would be the more common. The, the moment there's separation, physical separation between the road and the rubber, we lose that aspect of the grip. That's one of the main reasons you see a big step change in grip from a wet driving condition to a dry driving condition and back to a wet driving condition. In a dry driving condition, we have hysteresis working well in the tire and we have chemical adhesion. When we move into a wet driving condition, we generally only have hysteresis working well in the tire. Adhesion is not able to take place because of the boundary layer of water between the rubber and the road surface. It's enough of a separation to stop those chemical bonds forming. The last method of grip generation is quite literally to overload the contact patch, as aforementioned, and just tear rubber off the surface, leave it behind on the road. That removal of rubber from the surface, tearing it off and leaving it on the road, does require some energy. We have to invest energy in the rubber to rip it. And in that investing of the energy, we do get some grip from the tire from doing so. But it's the most wasteful and often the least productive way to generate grip from a tire contact patch. Why is all of this important? Well, it's important to know that hysteresis is the fundamental way to generate grip from a tire. And it's important to know that hysteresis only really generates grip from a tire when there's a velocity difference between the road and the rubber. That is to say, the rubber has to be moving across the road. Or to go back to our earlier analogy, the rubber has to be being forced across the pyramids. It has to be being forced to deform and then reform over a shape. That velocity, that rubber on road velocity, becomes an absolute key aspect to everything else we're doing with chassis dynamics and suspension geometry. Here at Talk Developments, when it comes to setting up chassis dynamics and suspension geometry for our customers, we try to start from a basis of pure measurement and understanding what it is we're working with, both in terms of customer expectation, uh, the way that they plan to use the vehicle and drive the vehicle. But moreover, we like to measure the vehicle that we're dealing with, check its corner weight distribution, look at the chassis setup that we currently have, look at the tire that's going to be used, and then tailor each suspension geometry setup to suit the tire that the customer would like to use, the car that the customer has brought to us, and the driving style and balance requirements for that customer specifically. Thank you for watching our video. I hope it's helped shed a little bit of light on chassis dynamics and tire dynamics. 
In future videos, we're going to be elaborating on these subjects further. If you'd like more information about talk developments and the training courses that we offer, please click the link in the description below. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure you don't miss out on any of our further videos. Hi, and welcome back to the Dino Cell here at Talk Developments. In our last video, we spoke a lot about our Dino Cell's construction, the equipment that we have in here, and why we have it here in the cell. Today, as promised, we've hooked a car into the dyno, and we're going to take a look at how we use the dyno to tune this car. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about suspension geometry, chassis dynamics, and how tyres work. Behind me, you see a white Subaru Impreza STI Spec C, and it's wearing some. 